Well, this uh, week and throughout this whole year or the summer, we've been looking at encounters people had with the real God, meeting that real God. Today, we want to take a look at a man by the name of Joshua. And so I'd like to read for you from the account that's recorded in the fifth chapter of the book with his name, these words. So now when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went up to him and said, Are you for us or for our enemies? Neither, he replied, but as commander of the armies of the Lord, I have now come. Then Joshua fell face down to the ground in reverence and asked him, What message does my Lord have for his servant? The commander of the Lord's army replied, Take off your sandals, for the place you're standing is holy. And so Joshua did so. Now the gates of Jericho were securely barred because of the Israelites. No one went out, no one came in. Then the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have delivered Jericho into your hands along with its kings and its fighting men. March around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for six days. Have seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horns in front of the ark. And on the seventh day, march around the city seven times with the priests blowing the trumpets. When you hear them sound a loud blast on the trumpets, have all the army give a loud shout, and then the walls of the city will collapse, the army will go up, and everyone straight in. Now, I suspect that most of us at least have some acquaintance with this kind of story of the Battle of Jericho. Maybe it's Sunday school, vacation Bible school, maybe a veggie tale you watch when you were a kid, or maybe you remember Mahalia J Jackson or even Elvis apparently has recorded this African-American spiritual. Chances are you know the story of how the walls came a-tumbling down, but chances are also fairly good that you aren't all that acquainted with this encounter that happened to Joshua the day or so prior. But these three verses in the chapter 5 are critical to understanding the battle of Jericho. And this is still one more of these encounters we're taking a look at this summer. So the story begins in chapter uh, 5 with verse 13. Now when Jer uh, Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him. Now, some context here. Why, and first of all, was Jericho, or why was Joshua near Jericho? And probably you know that story too, that the Israelites had been in, Isra in uh, Egypt for centuries, frankly, as slaves, but that God, with his mighty hand, had brought them out. They had crossed miraculously the Red Sea, then they had wandered in the wilderness, and eventually crossed the Jordan River, but as soon as they crossed it, there in front of them was this city of Jericho. Now, Jericho was a huge city, a walled city, and in human terms, an impossible city for these Israelites to take. And so Joshua, that night, went out to see what he was up against. Now, the reason he went out to look at it that night was almost certainly he was remembering something that had happened some 40 years prior because this was not the first time that Joshua had been near Jericho. If you go back to the book of Numbers, you'll read what had happened 40 years prior. Back then... The Israelites had gotten near to Jericho, near to Canaan. Moses had sent out 12 scouts, 12 uh, spies, as some of us call them, 12 men, each from one of the tribes that made up Israel, and they had reconnoitered the land to find out what they were facing there. And as a result of that kind of scouting, 10 of the 12 uh, spies said, it can't be done. They're too big. There's too much going against us. Only two of these spies, these scouts, said, we can do this. And that had been Joshua and Caleb. And as a result of the unbelief of the vast majority, the whole generation of Israel wandered in the wilderness 
and was not permitted into the promised land. Only Joshua and, jo and, and uh, Caleb, because of their faith, were allowed to cross the Jordan into Canaan. So 40 years have now passed, and as a result, Joshua by now is an old guy. I mean, we don't know how old he was, but Caleb was 85, so he's surely 80 years old. And one night, this night, Joshua goes out all by himself to look again at that fortified city. Almost certainly he remembers the amazing moment that had happened 40 years prior. He remembers standing with those other 11 spies and, and looking at what they faced and saying, this can't be done. I mean, how can we possibly break those walls? How, I mean, we're, we're just escaped spies or slaves. We're, we've got no military uh, skills. We've got no technology to lay siege to a walled city like that. And yet if we don't do this, if we don't conquer the land, well, they'll conquer us. We'll end up being slaves like we used to be, only now to a different master. Now these folks. And so Joshua is remembering all of this. This that had happened 40 years earlier. But he is also remembering what God had said back then and how he had said that fear... And caving into fear was an act of rebellion against God. In fact, Joseph or Joshua and Caleb said it themselves in Numbers 14. Only do not rebel against the Lord and do not be afraid of the people of the land. Don't rebel by being afraid. Now today, most of us would, I suspect, simply speak of some people being more risk-averse than other people. And there's really nothing that can be done about that sort of thing. It's probably more a, a matter of your DNA than anything else. But Caleb and God here says, your fear, your caving into your fear, your lack of courage is an act of rebellion, a sin against God. Now, maybe you're not still convinced. There's an unsettling verse that keeps coming up to me. It comes from the last book of the New Testament, last chapter of the book of the book. From the book of Revelation, we're told at the very end where uh, about those who will end up getting tossed into the lake of fire. And it's not a big surprise who some of these folks that get tossed in are like some are vile murderers idolaters practitioners of dark magic i mean i guess you'd expect that sort of a person but do you know who else earns a toss into that lake the cowards look verse eight but the cowardly the unwill on the unbelieving the vile the murderers the sexually immoral those who practice magic arts the idolaters and all liars they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur and so here we have Joshua. He stands some 40 years later all alone looking at this walled city. And he must have wondered, how is this time going to be different than the last time when we caved into our fears? How will we find the courage to assault these walls? And who will help us to do that kind of thing? And as he's asking those questions, almost certainly in his mind, he has this amazing experience. Verse 13. Now, when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hands. Now, when that man stands in front of him with a drawn sword in his hands, that means this man is ready for battle. So what does this 80-something-year-old guy named Joshua do when he sees this man with a drawn sword? 
But the text tells us, middle of verse 13, Joshua went up to him. And when it says Joshua went up to him, the narrator is telling us that Joshua is challenging this man. The battle for Cana has begun, Joshua is saying. We have come here to take this land. Therefore, whoever you are, choose this day who you will serve. I give you one of two options. Are you for us or are you our enemies? In other words, Joshua says, you can either fight me here now to the death or bow your knee to me and be part of this battle. Join us as we take this land. I, Joshua, I'm the general of this, this group coming in. Are you with us or not? What say you? What say you? And this mystery man literally says, no. Now, that's kind of a non sequitur. I mean, Joshua says, I've given you two options, and the man says, I reject them both. I am not the kind of person that is for or against anyone. People are for or against me. And you cannot relate to me unless you choose to be for me, but to ask me if I'm for you or against you, that's the wrong question. I know our translations has the responses neither, but I really do like the old King James that just simply says no. I just utterly reject, this man says, that I will be on one side or the other. The question is, whose side are you on? The question is, who are you going to follow? As commander of the armies of the Lord, I have now come, he goes on to say. And it seems that at that moment, Joshua realizes that this stranger, this man, infinitely outranks him. He hits the dust, falls face down in reverence. Joshua says, command me. What message does my Lord have for his servant? Verse 15, the commander of the Lord's army replied, take off your sandals. Take off your sandals. Why? Because your sandals are covered with dirt and you are in the presence of the Holy One. And Joshua did so. And so that's how this encounter ends. And then it goes on, the next part, to talk about the battle itself. So what does this encounter really tell us about meeting the real God? Let me suggest three lessons we can draw from this encounter. The first one can only be developed and understood if we first ask the question, who is this man in the first place? Now, over the years, people have speculated about all kinds of, of ways to identify this person. Some people, most people that have considered it have often suggested that this is an angel. Now, the truth is, we don't know a lot about angels. You read the Bible, and they show up occasionally, but angels are never, ever the center of the story and never the center of the attention. And we really don't know much about angels, but we do know one thing. The one thing we know about angels is you don't worship them. At the end of Revelation, the book, John says these words, I, John, and the one who heard and saw these things, and when I heard and had seen them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who had been showing them to me. But the angel said to me, don't do that. I am a fellow servant with you and with your fellow prophets and with all who keep the words of this scroll, worship God. See, this angel seems genuinely upset. Don't worship me. Don't do that. I am ultimately no different than you are. I may have more power and certainly am stronger, but at the end of the day, I am created just as are you. And if you worship anything other than the creator, if you worship anything created, it ruins you, John. Get up. Don't worship me. And yet when this man 
encounters Joshua in our story today. Joshua fell face down in the ground in reverence and asked, what message does my Lord have for his servant? The man doesn't say, get up, don't do that. In fact, not only does the stranger, this, mes- this mysterious man, not only does he accept the reverence, the act of reverence by falling to the ground, but he calls on him to take it one step further, to worship him even more intensely by taking off his shoes and realizing who he really is. He's saying in that moment, you are in the presence of the holy. You are in the presence of the unending, the beginningless, and the endless one. This is no hologram you're looking at. You are in the presence of a person. Who is this person? Well, I, along with a lot of folks, believe that this person was a preliminary manifestation of the eternal word of God who in the fullness of time would be born of a man, born under the law, to redeem those under the law from the curse of sin. And so who this person is, is this is the pre-incarnate second person of the Trinity. This is the pre-born Jesus, who the, or one person who will be called Jesus one day. This person standing before Joshua that day is there to let Joshua know he is not the general here. The general is that one standing in front of him. He's the one that will give the strength and power to the Israelites. He is the one that will guide them through all of their days. But first, they must recognize who he is. He's the one, the angel of the Lord who has come to Joshua, that second person of the Trinity. By the way, the same sort of thing happened uh, years earlier and was mirrored in the, same t- in the same kind of way when Moses finds himself in front of that burning bush. Listen, there, there the angel of the Lord appeared to Moses in flames of fire from within a bush. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place you are standing is holy ground. And so the first thing I think we can understand as we realize who this person was is that this is Jesus, the second person of the Trinity. This is God himself, and he has come to fight for them. He will be there with them as they face all the fears that they are feeling as they look at those walls in front of them. And so that's the first blank. Jesus is the one who comes to fight for us. There's a second truth we can pull from this encounter as well. And that is that Jesus is absolutely holy. Now, this has been a common theme that we have seen throughout all these encounters that we have been looking at this summer. Whether it was Jacob who finds himself wrestling with this mysterious person in the night and watches as that one with his finger touches his hip bone, and his whole hip is disjointed. The power of that moment, that moment, that's when he realized it. And the same thing happened when Job, finally, after all of the arguments and the anger he expressed because of what had happened to him, sees and encounters the same great one in that whirlwind. And now Joshua meets God as he encounters this man of war who comes to him as someone armed to the teeth with a drawn sword. You see, there's not too much that's warm and fuzzy about meeting the real God. I mean, you can make up a God that's warm and fuzzy. But when you meet the God of Scripture, the God of the Bible, you encounter a a holy God. What's holiness? It's the greatness of God. The holiness of God is his supremacy. See, there is more to Jesus than 
only his grace and his love. And if we fail to also encounter his holiness and his greatness, well, then his grace and his love will fail to transform us. And Jesus is saying, if you want to see me for who I am, you have to see all that I am. And if Jesus is who he said he is, that means that, well, that he is Lord of everything. That there's not a single corner of your life that doesn't belong to him. There's not a square inch of this universe that doesn't belong to him. Let me see if I can illustrate it. Imagine that you invite me to your house some evening and I show up at your doorstep and, and you say, oh, Paul, come on in. But if you don't mind, keep the Jordan part out. I, I like the Paul part, but I'm not so sure about the Jordan part. But I can't really do that for you. I'm not half Paul and the other half Jordan. And so if you want me to come in, you, I have to come in as I am. I, I, I'm not half Paul and half Jordan. I'm, I'm both. I'm all Paul and all Jordan. And if you want Jesus, you have to take all of him. And so you might say, well, I, I like the parts about love and grace. I like the fact that he helps us. I like the fact that he'll be with us in the hard times. But, I, you know, can we just skip over the holy part? The great, the, the powerful part? Well, you can, and plenty, plenty of people do, but that's not the real Jesus. The real Jesus is all of that. He is loving and gracious. He is also holy and powerful. I've been reading a book uh, recently by Eric Metastas called Miracles. It's talking about miracles of all kinds. One chapter is about the miracle of creation. He talks about some of the extraordinary realities about our universe. He says that if, uh, if the distance between the earth and the sun were, as, were the thickness of one sheet of paper, if the thickness between the earth and the sun were the where the thickness of one piece of paper, then the distance between the earth and the nearest star would be a stack of paper 70 feet high. And the distance between the earth and the edge of our small galaxy would be a stack of paper 310 miles high. And our galaxy is a speck just the smallest of specks in this universe that we cannot simply see the end of. And yet Hebrews 1 says that Jesus Christ holds the universe together with the word of his power. This Verse 3. The sun is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. Jesus Christ holds the universe together with his pinky. So let me ask you a question. Is that the kind of person that you invite into your life to be your assistant? If Jesus is the general we don't answer, he doesn't answer to us, we answer to him. Now, look, the truth is, all of us come, almost all of us, come to Jesus like Joshua did. We all come saying something like, look, God, I, I need some help here. I mean, I've got an agenda, I'll be honest about it. I'll become a Christian, but I need some help from you. Will you help me? I, I, I need some help with my marriage. I need some help with my work. I need some help with my kids. Help me, I've got a problem here. That's what Joshua does. We got a campaign going on here. We're about to attack the city. Will you help us with this thing? I want to know, are you for us or are you against us? We all say that. Will you help us? The question isn't, though, 
will you help us? The question is, do you know who you're talking to? Because while it's true, he does help us. And that's how we get started with him. Eventually, we discover that he is someone more than we ever dreamed. He comes to us as God himself. And we've got to ask, not will he meet our expectations, will he fulfill our agenda, but are we ready to fulfill his? There were two thieves on the cross, you may know, that were crucified on either side of Jesus. We call the one the good thief, the other the bad thief. The first one said, if you're the son of God, get down. Will you help me out here? I, I've got a bit of an agenda. I'd like to, frankly, live, if you don't mind. Therefore, would you help us? On the other hand, the other thief said, forgive me. Remember me. Allow me to be with you in your kingdom. You see, the first one said, are you for us or are you against us? Are you going to help us out or not? And what you decide and how you answer that will determine whether I follow you. The second one simply said, I can't talk to you that way. I can only acknowledge that I need to be forgiven and I ask that you'd remember me. Because I now realize you're the real God. You're the real general of the universe. And when you realize who you're talking to, you don't talk to them like they're a a second lieutenant. And so when you say, I like to believe in you, God, but will you help me with my problems? Will you help me get through school? Will you help me reach my marketing goals? Jesus says, well, those are really the wrong questions. The, quest, the answer isn't yes or no. The answer is none of the above. That's not what I'm about. You come to me conditionally. If you come to me saying yes, you still don't know who I am. Are you treating me like I'm a lieutenant? Or do you recognize I'm the general of this world, this universe? See, I come that way. Or I don't come at all. And so that's the second blank. If Jesus is a general, he doesn't answer to us. We answer to him. And the last thing to remember about this mysterious man is that he comes with a drawn sword. He comes with a drawn sword. The question is, why did that drawn sword not come down on Joshua's head? I mean, do you remember what happened after the expulsion of Adam and Eve from the garden? Listen, after he drove the man out, God placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden, cherubim, in a flaming sword, flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life because the wages of sin is death. And everyone who tries to get back to the bliss, back to the garden, back into the presence of a holy God as a sinful person will face the sword. Sinful people cannot face a holy God. So then why did that sword not come down on Joshua's head that night? Well, it's because of what had happened just before this moment. A couple of verses prior, we read, on the evening of the 14th day of the month, while camped at Gilgal, on the plains of Jericho, the Israelites celebrated the Passover. See, it was during that Passover, a young lamb without blemish went under the sword as a promise that one day that same commander that had the drawn sword would come in weakness, not in strength, and take that sword himself, so that the sword of the Lord is now for us and not against us. 
And so that's the reason that that sword was held because of the promise that God himself would one day take the sword himself. And that's what he does, doesn't he? When Jesus comes, dies on a cross, and allows himself to take the hit that we deserve. And so, all to say that's the reason that today we can live courageous lives. We can live lives with boldness. We can approach the holy with confidence. We have full access to him now because of what Christ did by paying the penalty and taking the sword himself. And because of that, we don't have anything to fear anymore. You don't have to spend your life gripped by fear. You don't have to spend your life always wondering because the God of the universe has deemed you now fully pardoned, fully forgiven, and given the spirit that, that allows you to now do what he calls you to do, to fight the battles he calls you to fight, and to know that he will be with you as you do. And that's why tonight or today we close with communion to remind us that we can approach this God now with full access and confidence because of what Christ did on the cross. And so this morning, to kind of symbolize that, we're going to do communion just a tad differently. We're going to uh, invite you to come up and receive the elements. We're going to have a station here and there and over there. Come to whichever one feels most comfortable for you. And as you come, you're coming and can come knowing that the access that we've always wanted with God is now available to all of us. And you can come confidently because the blood of Christ covers you and allows you to know that no matter what you've done, you have now, because of that, been given this gift of forgiveness. Because it was on the night in which he was betrayed, he took a piece of bread, offered the blessing, broke it and said, this is my body broken for you. After supper, he took the cup and said, this cup is a new promise I make to all of you. Drink it as often as you do, remembering me. And so as the folks come forward to give you those elements, we invite you to prepare yourself to receive this gift, to come and to know you can come confidently, boldly, because the price has been paid. Come. All is ready. Mm -hmm.